This is the Adopted Mom Podcast. Adoption may look different for each family, but we need solidarity from other crazy people who took this leap. And that is what we do here. We encourage, we build up, we share the wins and losses. We lean on each other and we get through this together. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Season 3, Episode 14, with me, Alex Fitton, your host. So 14 out of 15, that means this is the second to last episode, which means we're almost done with Season 3, which means this is nuts. I'm so excited. We've been able to do this for three whole seasons almost, and I'm already working on season four, and that is all thanks to you guys. I'm so incredibly appreciative. And if you want to keep up the good work and you want to keep helping the podcast out, be sure and rate and review it on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen if you haven't already. That's going to get this baby into more ears, and that'll just make season four even more awesome. So thank you so much, you guys. I want to let you guys know before I talk about this week's episode that next week we will take a week off for Christmas, and then the final episode, episode 15, will launch on New Year's Eve. So celebrate the end of 2018 with listening to the season finale of the Adoptive Mom podcast. What could be better? Today, I have for you guys an interview with Camila Bunn, and she is the CEO of the Adoption Exchange Association, which is the um, organization responsible for the National Heart Gallery. That's big stuff, you guys. I am so honored that she took the time to do an interview with me, and they were heavily involved with the production of Instant Family, a movie that I'm sure you have all at least heard of, if not seen one million times already. So definitely... Um, get excited about this interview. And I have more information on a giveaway for this month's email sign up. You know, you guys get the um, sensory gift guide from occupational therapist Leah Burry. And to add more excitement, we have a giveaway. And like I said, we'll have more information on that later in the episode. So until then, let's jump in. All right, guys, I get so excited when I get to introduce you guys to just powerhouse women who are out there doing the amazing things uh, in the nonprofit world for adoption. And with that said, how's it going, Camila? Oh, how's it going to you, Alex? You're also a powerhouse woman. (laughs) I don't know about all that. I don't have a C in front of my title yet. So, Um, (laughs) but you are you do have a C in front of your title. So tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Sure. Well, thanks again for inviting me on. I'm Camila Bunn. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Adoption Exchange Association. And the Adoption Exchange Association is short, well, we call ourselves AEA for short. Uh, And what we basically do is we increase foster care adoptions. We're all about finding homes for kids, and it's great work. That's so fun. And so, I'm, you know, you work a little bit with another big nonprofit, the Dave Thomas Foundation, and we've interviewed them as well. In what capacity do you guys uh, do you guys work together? Yeah, there's a lot of alignment um, between us and the Dave Thomas Foundation, and that we're also, as they are, on a mission to ensure that no child ages out. Yeah. Of foster care. And, you know, I know you're familiar with aging out. I don't know how many of your listeners are, but aging out is a tragic situation where a child at the age of either 18 or 21, depending on their state, um, has to leave foster care ultimately without a family. And that at that tender age, which, you know, even though they're technically adults, it's really challenging. I mean, I know a lot of people who are still in their parents' basements. And, you know, for a young person to leave without that safety net, without anyone to be with them at their graduation, to help them with college, it's tragic. And so we're trying to find homes, especially for older children. And our work with the Dave Thomas Foundation is really looking at social workers because social workers are the ones who are responsible for finding homes for the children, educating families, preparing families. And if we have really strong, competent and 
a steady supply of social workers, then our children are less likely to age out. Yes. And I mean, we've talked before and you know that that's a cause that's really near and dear to my heart. And I want to um, I definitely want to get into some more background of that and how people can get involved. Um, And before we before we really talk about the AEA and what they what exactly they do for the adoption world, I want to hear more about you. So can you tell us just about your background? What how um, how your heart arrived in this incredible work and just a little bit more about your family? Sure, sure. Well, I'm the proud parent of a six-year-old, and I've got a, you can't tell from here, but I've got another one on the way. (laughs) What? I did not know that. I didn't tell you that. Oh, my gosh, yes. My belly bump is hidden. So, Congratulations, ma'am. Thank you very much. Yeah, so um, we're very excited. I live in the state of Maryland, and, um, you know, really parenthood for me is, amazing. And I want to be able to ensure that other families can build their family through adoption. It's an important, um, a very important cause. Uh, There are so many children over half a million in foster care. And so um, hearing about their stories was really my foray into this work. Um, It wasn't like I went out with the mission of doing adoption work, but it quickly finds you. That's what a lot of us say. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, um, when you hear about a young person who doesn't have someone to count on, doesn't have an unconditional, doesn't know what unconditional support feels like, doesn't really have an, a high quality relationship with an adult, um, who can s- keep them safe, you know, all their all their me- memories are of um, situations where they were abused or neglected. That's an issue, you know, and it has um, ramifications in the future for that child and for society. And so when I started to hear about the stories, it, it really resonated with me. And um, I went to college, I had my degree in business, and a lot of my colleagues um, who had their MBAs were going off you know, promoting all kinds of um, products and services. And I said, you know, this is a social cause that I feel is resonating with me right now. And I really want to provide a voice for children in foster care who, who really need all of us to amplify their voice. Absolutely. Um, I, I love that. I think it's really cool because, you know, I have a very similar background. I wasn't adopted. Uh, neither of my parents were adopted. We didn't have any family friends who adopted or fostered, really. Um, And my mom always just cracks up because my passion for this just came out of nowhere. And when I talked to you, I realized that it was it was kind of similar, that it was just and I think that that almost makes it cooler that it doesn't necessarily hit home, but that you see it and you go towards it um, even when it doesn't necessarily do something for you. So I I just think that that's really awesome. Um. There are so many people who I think um, are like us, Alex, that want to make a difference. And so there are a lot of ways that you can make a difference in the life of a child, whether you be an adoptive parent, a foster parent, or a child advocate. Um, I'm, I'm sure you you agree that you feel like you're a child advocate, ultimately, and there's such a need for more voices out there to support children who are in need. Yes. And one of our other... Uh kind of mutual causes is I know that when we talked before, you express kind of a passion for supporting parents and supporting the social workers so that they can continue this work so that they don't get burnt out. So tell me a little bit about y'all's uh, what y'all are doing in that area. Yeah, yeah. So that's called the I care program. It's uh, an acronym. We love acronyms in this world. <laughs> <laughs> You and your marketing degree, right? (laughs) So it's the initiative to create adoption ready employees. Um, I care. I like that better. And um, what we're really about is uh, encouraging uh, students, you know, or people who are early in their careers trying to decide what I want to do. You know, how can I make a difference? How can I um, transform, you know, someone's lives? someone's life and uh, adoption work is a great profession to get in to. And what we're learning um, is that there are a lot of social workers who enter the field and then they, they kind of get 
um, I don't know the right word to say, maybe um, not disenfranchised, but they get disheartened Mm. by um, the lack of information or perhaps some cognitive dissonance around, okay, I thought it was going to be one way and it's a different way. Or, you know, just a challenge of working with children who've experienced trauma and not having enough support. Uh, And so what we are doing is we're really about trying to provide that support, trying to really fill in the gaps through the eye care program. So we have a lot of information on our website, which is adoptea.org forward slash eye care, where you can learn more about other people who are doing this work, you can have a more realistic preview of the type of work that adoption work is. You can read testimonies. Um, you can, and then when you're ready, you can actually take the first step to apply for jobs. So it's, you know, quite challenging for people and we're national. So if you're looking for adoption work jobs, rather than looking in you know, multiple adoption organizations, you can just come on to our website and we pull all that data together for you and you can review all the available positions that are out there. And then um, we also have a national conference where we're doing work with students to really provide them with an opportunity to network with people who are currently doing the work so they can ask questions one-on-one to have a better perspective of what it's like. They can build networks, they can, you know, um, have those mentors and potential employers who can in the future employ them or provide internship opportunities for them. That's so cool. And I think it's great that, you know, you guys have that all of that in one hub, you know, that if someone's wanting, you're making it easy for someone wanting to get involved where there, there's less red tape where they can find the information that they need and get into this work. Um, I don't know, without without feeling burned out before they even get there. Uh, and that that kind of leads us to another issue, which is the secondary trauma. And I love that, you know, I feel like I feel like there are a lot of adoption organizations that um, maybe unintentionally or with great intentions, they they kind of brush over the uh, that aspect of trauma. But I hear that word coming out of your mouth a lot. And I think it's it's amazing that you're saying, yes, this totally exists. But instead of pretending it doesn't, let's learn about it and let's prepare people for it. Yes, yes, you know, and we want to prepare people for it. We want to prepare people for the trauma they'll they'll experience, whether they be a parent or a social worker. Um, you know, um, these children, due to no fault of their own, come from hard places, and it just means that there's a lot of work that's required to um, unpack. I like to say, peel the onion. You know, for a variety of reasons, they've they have that barrier, you know, around, and um, it's a it's a tough shell to break through. And so, um, the social workers, through you know, for instance, our work with eye care, are responsible for finding ways to really get through that shell, to peek little holes through it, you know, little by little, through building trust and letting the child know that they are a safe person to talk to. Um, Imagine any one of us having experienced some trauma in our lives and, you know, um, whether it be uh, something as simple as, you know, touching something hot on the stove, you know, for instance, you know, you know, that's hot, that surface is hot. Are you going to try that again? And so for our children, particularly the ones who have been in a family and something tragic has happened, it's like, whoa, danger, you know, I don't want to go there again. And so the social workers are ultimately responsible for unpacking what that means, um, helping the child to deal with what that means. But not giving up on the idea that you can find, we can help you be successful or find a family that is not going to mistreat you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or we can help you to go back home after your parents have been rehabilitated. That's another important piece. We also want to preserve families, if at all possible. Um, That's a part of our work too. You know, um, we're dealing with the opioid crisis. There's a whole influx of children coming into foster care. Not all of them, hopefully not all of them will become eligible for adoption, but we should be doing everything possible to be prepared should that happen, Mm -hmm. but then also work with the the, uh, birth family to see if they can clear up the behaviors that cause the initial abuse and neglect. 
you know, work on their own trauma and then, and then go forward. And so the social worker really being the cog in the wheel of that multi-spoke wheel, right. Um, deals with a lot, you yeah. know? And so as an organization, we've recognized that 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 is a population that we need to do everything possible to support them, to provide them with with um, an outlet, um, a mentor, um, a conference where they can grow their skills, but also meet other people who have also dealt with challenging experiences. So it's just um, a great work, great opportunity to do that with our partners. Yeah, and I I hear you when you're talking about this. You you keep going back to the beginning of, of the issue. And I know that that's important to you, the systemic change and not just, not just fixing the top level issues, but, but changing this at its core and preventing the need for future intervention, right? Absolutely. You know, one of the ways that we're hoping to bring about systemic change is to really look at the people who are ultimately responsible for carrying out and meeting many children in the process. So um, we decided to focus on adoption social workers because we wanted to provide that social worker who would see multiple children uh, with the chance to have the skill set, have the mentor, have the connection uh, to um, and be able to provide that to multiple children. So really the systemic change that we're talking about is really bringing about gener- helping generations of children who would be seeing that same social worker over the course of time. I, that's, gosh, it's so beautiful because I think that, I mean, you're right, there are new issues and there are new problems, but um, there are so many deeper issues that kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's uh, that chart that has all the bubbles coming off of the one bubble that's, uh, help me out here. Uh know what you're saying, but I can't think of it right now. <laughs> I know, right? It's like I'm blanking out. But it's, you know, there is so like the opioid thing, you know, that's a, a, you know, in the grand scheme of the adoption system in the United States, that's a newer issue. And I have dealt with that personally with a child in my home. And that is so hard. But the root, you know, the root of all of that is are things like poverty cycle and uh, just generational abuse and things like that. And I love that you're addressing those things as well as the new things. And that's a lot to take on. Um, mm-hmm. So you must have a pretty killer team because that's <laughs> that's overwhelming to me. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great team. I mean, we're a national organization. We have a strong national member network. A lot of our work with AEA centers around our members and our members are adoption professionals who are really out there on the front lines. And as many other associations, like the ones who represent nurses, you know, ANA or SHWARM, who represents human resource professionals, we provide the educational support and the and also the support um, period, the support for their secondary trauma. Um, so it's it's really important that we are strong so that we can support them. But ultimately, our members are the ones who are really doing that day in day out work. That's awesome. And um, you know, you, you've said that you're a national organization, and one of the coolest things I think that you guys do is. Uh, adopt us kids and i want you to talk about that but also and i don't i think this was before your work with the aea but you also ran a branch of wednesday's child as well right so these yeah. are some of these those i mean i say smaller they're not smaller but you know if you have the aea as the major hub you know there are all of these little initiatives that are plugging adoption all over the country so talk to us about some of those things Sure, sure. So um, when you think about adoption, a lot of times people think about the finalization, you know, that occurs in family court um, and that very exciting moment. But if you really go backwards in that process, there are lots of strategies that go into making that adoption happen and making that family whole. And so I was fortunate enough in my career to have an opportunity to really work on a number of strategies um, that move children towards adoption. Uh, Many of them, many of our our members and many of the organizations that do adoption are heavily uh, connected with the media. Um, We learned uh, a long time ago that uh, media and so now social media and the Internet, you know, how many people have cell phones and, you know, smartphones and are constantly checking in. I know I am. I'm addicted. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, where are are people getting their information? Right. Um, So 
we want to make sure that adoption is a top of mind as well. So some of the programs that help to bring that into people's living rooms is a program like Wednesday's Child or Tuesday's Child. You might have heard of it um, differently. It's called different things in different states. But I was fortunate enough to participate in the D.C. Wednesday's Child program where we introduced a general public to a child who was in the D.C. area who needed a home. And it was fantastic. You know, it was one of the strategies we use to find homes for our children. Um, we would uh, we had a, a person at the local news who was willing to um, do this work and meet the kids. And I would organize different fun activities. I mean, it was really challenging for some of the children because, you know, one, they're, they're really being vulnerable. They're talking about who they are uh, and to, you know, anyone who's watching the news. Um, and yet they do that because they recognize that um, by doing so, they're going to be able to hopefully find a family. And there are many, many success stories that I've witnessed as a result of that strategy. Um, some of the other strategies are also kind of an old idea, but it's being you know modified over the t- over time. Is photo listing. So um, people hear, hear the word photo listing and they're not sure what is photo listing. Well, photo listing is where you would see a photo of a child and a little description of them, and it's often online. It used to be with our member members across the country. We're a fairly old organization. We've been around since 1982. So prior to the internet we would actually create picture books, if you will. And we would be, you know, at a grocery store, set up a table. You've seen people who do that. Um, <laughs> and, and you would, you know, talk to people about, about the um, children who are in their community who need to be adopted. And so what, what happened with the Adopt U.S. Kids Project in 2001, that work went online um, through a national photo listing service. And so, Images and information on the children is available. Sometimes quotes on the children are available for people to really understand more about who is available to be adopted and how they can help the children who who need us the most. Um, so those are two of the strategies that I was you know fortunate enough to be a part of um, in in my in my tenure. But there are so many others. There's the strategy of social workers doing what's called an adoption exchange where social workers come together and they present children and families who are waiting to be adopted. So families who are hoping to adopt as well as children who are hoping to be adopted in the hopes of finding a match. There are also match parties um, where children are uh, prepared and parents are prepared for the day as well. And they're invited to do a fun activity together. Um, a trend we're seeing at AEA are a lot of cooking parties because who doesn't love food? I do. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, uh, yes. And um, so we bring, you know, often, especially the teenagers together with families. And it has helped us to um, really dispel some of the myths around our children because so many people have misconceptions about teenagers, right? Mm-hmm. And so match event will allow them to get to know children on a one-on-one basis without knowing their age and really create an organic connection, right? Without even more, you know, about their age, et cetera. So it's really helpful as a way of introducing older children who may not have an opportunity otherwise to get to know a family um, through a match event. Um, Some of the other strategies that we're using are publications. Um, We send out publications, many of our members do, to their network um, and and other activities as well to really, again, make people aware of these children, have the families inquire about them, and then we all are marching towards that finish line of that adoption occurring. After the adoption occurs, though, there's still a lot more work to do. Um, we don't want to just leave the families to their, you know, to say, okay, you drive off into the sunset. There's still, you know, some support that's needed, right? Yes. And that's something that a lot of our members are engaged in as well. Um, therapy, um, you know, uh, mentoring, again, mentoring for, other, for families to family, support groups. Um, and a lot of that work is really important. And we're trying to really normalize 
the idea of asking for help. Um, so there's a number of ways our members do that because we do know that some individuals in our in our society uh, might shun that and say, oh, I don't know about, you know, going to therapy and all of that. Um, do I really need it? And it, we want people to feel like there's no stigma associated with that. We just want to be here to support you and make sure that the family remains strong. So it's voluntary, but we're really trying to encourage people to take advantage of those services. And so where can people find information about just some of those uh, some of those programs that you just mentioned, especially about, you know, the match parties and just some of those online online resources? Is that all at the Adoption Exchange, Exchange Association website? Yeah, yeah. They can learn more about some of the recruitment strategies that are trends we're seeing. The Heart Gallery, I, I was remiss to not mention that. That's another one um, that we're seeing as well as a way of introducing children to the general public. Um, these are all excellent recruitment strategies that our members are doing to let the community know about the half a million children who are in foster care and the 117,000 who are waiting to be adopted. Yes. And um, I'll have that on the show notes for you guys as well if you want to reach out and um, and take advantage of those resources. But you have been mentioning a lot, you know, I, I, this kind of circles back to our talk earlier about priority on kids, a, kids aging out and just priority on teens in general. And it kind of uh, includes what we talked about earlier about you, you not brushing over or, um, or ignoring the trauma, but instead preparing people for it. And I know that that is something that you guys do a lot for, you know, you, you have the, you know, this line in the middle of before aging out and what can we do to help these kids to reach them before they get to that line. But if they do get that line and they're not adopted, you have stuff for them too, right? You, you help them get jobs and other things. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, I'm a firm believer in really a covenant. I, I believe we create with every child who gives us permission to work to find them a family. We create, in essence, a covenant with that child. We that, that child trusts us as an adoption professional, social worker, to do everything we can to find them a family. And I firmly believe that if we're unsuccessful, we still owe that child everything we can do to make sure that they transition out of foster care successfully. That's one of the things that, um, you know, in, in a variety of roles, I've always tried to incorporate um, what we call independent living skills in some way. So that way we're on really tangential tracks with each child to make sure, okay, we're going to do everything we can to find a family, but if that's not successful, what else can we do? Um, so I'll talk a little bit, Alex, about the work that I've seen being done and then the work that we're doing now at AEA. Um, so some of the work that we I've seen happen that's been very successful are um, programs where we help children to go to college. Mm -hmm. uh, we help them to not just get into college, but go through college. Um, and I mentioned this at the, at the outset that, you know, imagine, um, you know, everyone needed to get those extra long sheets and the micro fridge and all the things you need for your college dorm, right? Well, imagine not having a family to really help you with that. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we want to make sure that child has the resources they need to get the items they need, the tangible items they need to to, you know, be available and be ready for, for college. And so that's some of the things that I've seen very successful programs across the country um, that are uh, fundraising um, to provide those resources for children who have aged out but are headed to college. Um, I've also seen programs, and this is one that we're doing now, um, with Walmart Foundation and the Community Grant Program, um, where we've partnered with a local department of social services and connected them with Walmart to ensure that young people who have aged out or are on the verge of aging out have access to jobs. Um, Walmart is an excellent. Obviously, everyone knows Walmart is major 
here. Uh, but what I've learned recently through our partnership with Walmart is just how extensive their training and their development is and how invested, how much they invest in every associate that they work with. Um, so to get a child plugged in to the Walmart community, um, especially a child who is vulnerable, who may not have a lot of resources and a lot of support is is magnificent because that community there at Walmart, what I've witnessed in my partnership with them so far is they really are surround the child. In fact, the, the hiring manager at the local store here said, oh, you know, I'll just be mama to them, you know? <laughs> and I thought, wow, you know, this is a really awesome culture because for children who, who don't have um, a, a permanent place to live, um, it, it's really important that they have a community, right? Um, so I think that connecting them with, with employers who are going to not just employ them to sell a good or, but really invest in them as a, as a person, I think is really important. And it's handing them those life skills along the way. You know, those are things that it might not be the immediate goal, but it's going to come through mentorship and through just having the, the resources and the, 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 um, I don't know, the freedom to develop those skills instead of just solely focusing on survival, which is a lot of what these kids know. Exactly, exactly. And I want to remind you guys, you know, all of my local listeners, you know, we're, we're local to Walmart land. And so we become dis kind of what you were saying, disenfranchised a little bit, or uh, we just get so used to all the things that Walmart does, but you're not local. And this is, I just think that's really cool that Walmart has its reaches everywhere and that they're doing awesome things. All right, guys, I hope you're enjoying my interview with Camilla. And before we jump back in, I want to, as promised, tell you guys all about my giveaway for the month of December, just in time for Christmas. So you know that all month, if you sign up for my email list, you're going to get a free sensory gift guide that I teamed up with my occupational therapist friend to create for you guys. It is awesome. It comes with this super easy Amazon wish list. You just click on all of that stuff, add it to your cart, and then your kid's going to have a whole lot of awesome under the tree that's going to help them and it's going to be fun for them. So in addition, we are so excited to announce that we're doing a giveaway for one of the items on the list, but you have to be signed up for my email list to get it. So what are you waiting for? Go to the adoptive mom podcast.com slash email. That is always in the show notes at just the adoptive mom podcast.com. So I'm making it really easy for you guys. Just sign up for your, sign up your email and you will be entered to win. If you're already on my email list, you're already entered easy peasy. I'm so excited to be able to offer this to you guys. And I'm so thankful to my friend Leah for making it all happen. So yeah, I don't know. That's it. I think just do that. So, all right, back to the show. You know, I love, I was saying that I love all the work that you guys are doing and how, how that impacts those kids who unfortunately do age out. Unfortunately, they don't find parents and how they can find a support system past that line. But what are some of the more specific things that you guys do to prepare families for having an older child? Some of the more tangible things. Mm hmm. Absolutely. So that would be our work that our members are doing. And there's a, a number of examples of that. Um, in fact, I was just in New Jersey um, meeting with one of our members and they were talking about the work they're doing, um, a program called Connect to Adoption. Um, in the state of New Jersey, where they're really working with families who are licensed and ready to go to fur to better understand the children who are available to be adopted and to provide them with training. Um, so, for those of you who may not be familiar, I know Alex, you're you're an adoptive parent, so you know. Um, but there is a training. There's a pre-adoption training that all families go through. It's either MAP or PRIDE or some other acronym. Again, we love acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very early, right? Don't you think it's kind of early? I mean, they do it right after the um, – often it's right after you you submit your application and they – you have a training and it's usually 30 or so hours over the course of a month, right? Right. And then you do a home study and then you wait. You wait for a call for placement, right? So New Jersey was really smart. They said, okay, you know, there's that wait period. What can we do 
to keep the learning going, right? Because you've learned something, it's been months, you're waiting, you're waiting, you're hoping, you know, for a call, for a placement, um, for a child to be, you know, you'd be notified about a child who, who needs you. And so during that period of time, you know, what they're doing in New Jersey is really doing a lot of trainings with families. Um, they're having families talk to other families. Um, they're providing the families with um, more specific information on the children. They're doing presentations of the children who are available to be adopted. You know, it's a really important and easy I don't want to say easy, but it's a good time to um, really provide families with as much preparation as possible during that wait, that wait period. Absolutely. And I think that, that it, it would almost have the opposite effect of what a lot of people are afraid of. I think um, a lot of people are afraid of if you're if you're exposed to some of the struggles that maybe you won't reach that finish line. Maybe you won't get to the place where you're actually taking children into your home. But I am such a firm believer. And that's why the podcast exists is that that's not true at all that I you know, I wish we had been better prepared. And I wish that other people could be better prepared, because I think that that almost that helps that burnout that helps that. Um, I don't know, just just secondary trauma and stuff like that. Uh, I I love that. And I think that New Jersey needs to share their secrets because I think that that's, <laughs> that's a yeah. really great initiative just to keep people, um, you know, you hear mentions of things like RAD and, you know, ODD and stuff in your training. And then four months later, you actually are exposed to it. Yep, exactly. Yeah, and there's a national training program right now that the federal government, the Children's Bureau is investing in to find some answers to those, you know, questions of when do we share information? How do we share information? What do we share, you know, with families at what stage? And I think it's really important questions that need to be answered. Um, And we're hearing from child advocates, we're hearing from adoptive parents that, hey, we need more, we need to know more, you know, we like to know more and we like to know what to expect. And we like for you to be in the picture as we are parenting. Um, and so that's really important too, that we provide that, what, what we call in-service training, but then also before the placement, before the child is placed in the home to give them even more information, because you're right. I mean, when that, when that social worker, when you, you know, say yes over the phone and then they show up, right? It's like a first date, right? You get those (laughs) chairs. You're like, are they going to like me? Are they going to like my cooking? Are they going to like it here? (laughs) Is it going to work out, right? I mean, all those things. And then on on the other hand, the child is on the other side of that door thinking, are they going to accept me? Are they going to like me? You know, am I, is this going to be forever? You know, all those feelings. Um, Am I ever going to see my mom again? You know, all of those things really um, are important. And then what do you do, right? So what are some real practical ways to parent, successfully parent a child who has experienced trauma. And so the federal government is investing in, in programs right now to look at how do we, how do we unpack that? Um, what can we do? What can we provide? And then AEA, so you're, you're very, um, on point, Alex, that uh, we are sharing the Connect to Adoption program with our national member network. Um, the New Jersey program will be um, highlighted on our website so people can go on and, and read more about it. Awesome. It'll be coming out, I believe, in November for National Adoption Month. Um, so we'll have an article on that at our website. But yeah, I mean, all of those things are really important. And one of the one of the key ingredients, we think, to provide um all families regardless of where you live with uh the most the most beneficial most successful experience with, with your adoption is like you said just to share those great ideas right so um that's really the whole idea behind AEA is that we're a adoption exchange association we're always trying to be that cog in the wheel to share information to share those great ideas that are working other places and also to have social workers share practical ideas so that they can improve their practice where they are. Yeah. Oh, such good stuff. I'm just like, there's so much you guys are doing. And it goes back to what I was saying earlier. Like that's, that's so overwhelming to hear that you're just kind of at the top of that, like overseeing all of it. Cause that, um, sounds like a lot to do. (laughs) 
do it. We do it in in support of adoptive families who are really doing the work. So thank you uh, for what you do and uh, for all your viewers who are out there contemplating, should I take that next step in a journey? We love to have you as a part of this community. We love the adoption community. I know that I feel like it's really my second home. I was you know, fortunate enough to have both parents, have really great parents and and to grow up in that way. And, you know, I know that this might be talking on your heart, like, well, is there other kids out there who don't have that? Maybe you had it, but who else needs it? You know? And so I think there are lots of ways you can support. You can adopt, you can foster, you can become a child advocate. Um, you can work as an, as a social worker, even if you've already kind of said, Oh, you know, I'm, I'm done with, with, uh, with that, you know, phase of my life, there's lots of ways you can volunteer. Um, you can become a donor, you know, there's lots of ways to give back. Absolutely. And before we before we get into some of those more specific ways that we can help your organization. Um, is it okay if we move into some of these uh, closing questions that are on more of a personal level for you? Sure. Awesome. So first of all, I want to know how has this work as, as a non adoptive mom? How has this work impacted your parenting? Oh, well, first of all, when I started out as a recruiter, <laughs> as a outreach worker, I was one of those people at the grocery store. What grocery store do you guys have out there in Arkansas? What's I mean, your Walmart. <laughs> Walmart. I was outside the Walmart, y'all, and I had the table, <laughs> and I was the one who was approaching you like, hey, you ever thought about adopting? And I was this, you know, young person fresh out of college, and and they're like, what do you know about adoption? And you're right. What do you know about adoption, right? But I was a child advocate, and I still am. But it wasn't until I became a parent myself that I realized the gravity of the decision that I was asking people to make. It's the biggest ask anyone can make, right, to open your heart and home, really. Uh, and it it's touching to know that there are so many people who – take that step in that journey. But it also behooves us as the people who are making the ask, it behooves us to be there to support you. And our way of supporting you is by supporting the social workers who are really your connection um, to the system, to the children, et cetera, to make sure that you have the best experience possible. So um, as a parent, you know, I'm like, wow, okay, it, it continues, right? Um, I have a six year old daughter. And, you know, every day, I'm, you know, I'm working, I'm working, I travel a lot, I travel out to see my members. And, you know, it just means so much when I hug her at night, and I, you know, read her story, and I give her a kiss. Um, and I think about how many kids are, are lacking that. Um, and it it's, it's upsetting, but it also adds fire, adds fuel to my fire, so to speak. It makes me continue to do the work that I do. I love that. Um, just makes you appreciate those things because I know that, I mean, I, I see that in my own life as well. So, um, okay, so what is something that you wish you had known at the beginning of this journey in adoption work? Hmm. I wish I had known... Wow. You know, I didn't know that there was an adoption or a foster care crisis. Ah. I think a lot of us walk through life and we're oblivious, right? We're worried about ourselves. We're going through life, you know, and that's one of the main missions that we have is to promote so everyone knows, you know, there is a foster care crisis happening. Um, I probably would have invested more um, of myself earlier had I known about the issue, right? Um, because it, when you hear about it, you just are so shocked, really, um, that it could be a child, you know, in a family struggling, your next door neighbor. Uh, and you know, there are so many situations like that in this country. And if we all did a little something, um, as you said earlier, Alex, you know, you would have, you'd be able to take care of, you know, the cycles of generational 
poverty or abuse that occur. Um, so it's it's uh, not knowing. I would say is one of, is one of the things that I regret not knowing and not um, doing something sooner. Yeah, no, that's a good one. Um, so, what is something that you wish you had done differently? Hmm. So, I think that differently. I think that it's important that we think about youth who are aging out of foster care. Uh, I wish that there was more done for those young people. And I wish that um, as a system and as a society, we were also able to provide support for those children, um, particularly those who, again, are aging out um, and are couch surfing and don't have stable housing. Um, one of the programs that I've been very intrigued by that I would love to see, and I wish, th- you know, in terms of a difference, different strategy, I would love to see happen, you know, as a formal national model is intergenerational housing. Mm. Um, really brings young people who are, aging out of foster care together with seniors who also suffer from isolation and, you know, are looking for ways to give back and mentor young people. I would love to see more of those programs and I would love to be part of that, um, that national effort to really not just think about, um, how we can, you know, find homes for children, but also again, providing that safety net for children who, aren't able to adopt it for a, whatever reason or not, we're not successful working with them, but they do need that housing and they do need that, um, that support and that mentorship. I was about to say, so it's almost like a deeper level mentorship program. Um, this is like brand new information to me, but I, as you're talking, I'm like, Hmm, this is, that's super intriguing. I, I would love to know more as you're, um, as you're working through this initiative or as you're learning more about this initiative, cause that's really fascinating to me. Um, So my next question was, what have you seen are the best and worst ways to support adoptive families? Hmm. Well, I think I'll take the worst ones. I think that it's just a challenge when, you know, as a social worker, um, you may not have the support that you need, you know, to to do the job that needs to be done to support families. And so I think where I've seen um, situations falter is really from lack of support and it rolls down a hill, right? So it's a lack of support for the social worker and then it's a lack of support to the family because the social worker isn't getting their support. So that's one of the things that I've, I've seen. Um, and I would say what's successful, um, there are so many examples, but I'll name a few. Um, when there's a real um, connection between when it, when we can facilitate a connection between birth parents, adoptive parents, and social workers, we call it shared parenting. When it's a beautiful thing when it can happen, mm-hmm. um, it's, it's very difficult. Because what happens is it's true concurrent planning. And I know you're familiar with the word concurrent planning, but if you're unfamiliar and you're listening, um, concurrent planning is basically where you work on concurrent plans for the child's permanency. Mm -hmm. And permanency, we mean working on reunification, back with birth mom, and adoption. And so what it does is it says, okay, both parents matter. We're not going to create divided abilities for the children. Adoption or reunification is addition, not subtraction, right? So if it's addition, not subtraction, then what we're what we need to do as the adults surrounding these ch- this child is to say we're in this for the child and we're going to work with that child to know that they have more people who love them. And I think that it's a challenge for families to do that because both families, birth parent has to say, 
I see what you're doing and I appreciate the fact that you are taking care of my child when I can't right now. And the adoptive parent has to say, I know that you've struggled and I'm here to help this child and we're going to work together and we're going to see, can you come to birthday parties together? Can you, can you play a role with this child? You know, all of these things really matter. Um, so I've seen that be a great strategy when it works. It's phenomenal. Absolutely. I was like writing that down as you were saying it, because, um, that is something that is so important. Um, and I think that it's important to note that it doesn't have to be either or. Cause I think so many of us think that, um, so finally, how can we help specifically you and your organization? How can we be involved, um, by just flat out donating or by providing specific things for these kids who have aged out or what are some of the top priorities to help? Great. Yeah. Great question. Um, I would say, you know, for my organization, you know, go to our website, um, read a little bit more about what we're doing. Um, of course, you know, donations are always appreciated. We're a nonprofit organization, um, like so many are. And, you know, Taking a look, I would say, as you're listening, and, and thank you for listening, um, listen more. You know, continue to be aware of ways that you can make a difference and keep your heart open to these children because they deserve it. One little piece of information I'll, I'll leave you with, Alex, is there's a great new major motion picture coming out called Instant Family. Yes. And it's going to be phenomenal. Um, it includes Mark Wahlberg and is based off of a true story of a gentleman, a director by the name of Sean Anders and his journey to adopt from foster care. And I had the fortunate opportunity to see an advanced screening of that. And we're going to be coming the movie is going to be coming to Arkansas, I'm quite sure. Um, and I, I definitely encourage all of you um, to go out and see it and keep your heart open. Um, keep thinking about ways you can help out. And I love to hear from you. I'm on my phone a lot, <laughs> emailing, <laughs> you know, on LinkedIn. Um, and I love to connect anyone who's listening to an organization locally, we are national. So if you find in your heart that you would like to take the next step, um, reach out, let us know, let me know. And I'd be happy to connect you with an organization um, in your area. I, I love that. I'm always excited to know what national resources can connect people with local resources, because here in Arkansas, you know, I obviously know a lot of the resources here, but I have listeners everywhere. And when they ask me, I'm I'm so excited to know that you can be uh, that resource to help. Um, so I know you mentioned LinkedIn. Are you on Twitter or anything else where people can find you? Yeah, well, OK, so. My social media coordinator tells me, Camila, you have to have an authentic voice. <laughs> I'm not on social media too much beyond LinkedIn. Um, however, you can catch us um, on on Instagram through our eye care work. Um, that's directly to students and Twitter um, and Facebook. We have a presence there. But if you want to reach me personally um, through my website, um, you can find my email address and I can give it to you too, Alex. And um, and then, of course, you know, the the hub of all of this um, is our, our national program, Adopt U.S. Kids, which is through a cooperative agreement with the Children's Bureau. Um, so if people want more information on children who are waiting to be adopted across the country, can always visit AdoptUSKids.org. I love it. I'm so excited that we got to sit, sit down together and chat about literally like all the things that you are doing, which are still just. I don't know how you have enough hours in the day, but I'm just going to sit in awe for a second and be so grateful that you carved out a little bit of time for me. So thank you again. And congratulations again on your baby. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Adoptive Mom Podcast. I know this stuff is hard and I hope you found encouragement here. Remember, you are enough and you're doing a great job. God wants to be at the center of this journey, and he is big enough to redeem all of our mistakes. Don't forget to check out show notes and other resources at theadoptivemompodcast.com. Thanks again for listening.